Today we're going to look at two chapters from the book of Matthew, chapters 19 and 20. And Jesus is going to continue his very important teaching, explaining that in the kingdom of heaven, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. What did he mean by that? Chapter 19 marks a final change in the ministry of Christ and Matthew's gospel. It, the gospel shifts as Jesus turns toward Jerusalem and all that it will mean. Jesus has been teaching his disciples through parables and teaching them truths of the new covenant. But now he will teach them with a certain level of clarity. And not only that, in every conversation, in every time he turns around, the Jewish leaders are making clear their intentions. And yet we watch Jesus remain true to his purpose, true to his message of what the new covenant faith is going to mean. Jesus is focused on helping his disciples understand that the new covenant will exist between God and man, and it will not replace the old covenant, but instead will fulfill it. Jesus wasn't going to be the Messiah they had been taught was coming, the conquering king, the king like David. That didn't change the fact he was the Messiah that had been prophesied. The new covenant is going to be based on a grace relationship with God, not a ritual obedience to God. Obedience is important, but it's not the works that we'll be measured by. It's whether those works are the genuine fruit of a heart yielded to God. But there's something else I want you to notice in Jesus' teaching today. Jesus seems to be battling with the Pharisees. We look at the Pharisees from all that we know about them. From, we see them as the group of people that caused the death of our Lord and Savior. Instead, Jesus is looking at the group of people who would be the best at helping others come to know Jesus was their Lord. I want to throw a name at, out to you today. Remember Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of Pharisees and Sadducees. And he sneaks off in the night to come to see Jesus at some point. Nicodemus would help take Jesus off the cross and help prepare his body for burial. Jesus isn't just arguing with the Pharisees today to help his disciples understand the truth. He's arguing with the Pharisees because he cares about them too. He wants them to know the truth. So I want you to hear these parables not as some kind of argument with the Pharisees, but as words that Jesus is using in an effort to convince them. He has a few days left. He wants them to understand, either now or later, that he really truly is the Messiah. There is a verse from the book of Acts, I believe it's chapter 5, where they talk about many, after Peter's preaching, talked about how many, over 5,000 or 3,000, came to faith that day, many of whom were leaders in the Jewish faith. I'm convinced that some of these very people Jesus is arguing with right now, that some of them, a few of them maybe, would actually become his followers later on, like Nicodemus. Remember, Jesus has already told the Pharisees and Sadducees what he's reminded them of prophecy, 
when God said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. They had been warned, and now they will be accountable for every word Jesus is about to teach them. And not only every word, but the attitude he uses while he teaches them. Now hang with me. I'm gonna fly through these very well-known parables. But again, hear them as Jesus trying to convince these Pharisees and Sadducees of who he really is. Every Jewish boy was educated in the synagogue. The Torah, the first five books of the Bible, was their study. That's the book they studied. They were to memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Therefore, every one of the people Jesus is speaking to today would have been well familiar with Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4, that says, If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house. And if after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her, and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband, who divorced her, is not allowed to marry her again after she's been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Understand that wives by the first century had become like property, and by the first century, divorce had become a very easy thing. Uh, a person, a man, just had to walk up to his wife and three times look her in the face and say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. And they were divorced, and the woman was left destitute. Many of the prostitutes that existed in the first century were women who had been divorced and had no other way of feeding themselves and their children. This is something that you have to remember as you listen to Jesus' words to the Pharisees. In chapter 19, Matthew begins by saying, When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. So Jesus has left where he was, and he's moved into Galilee, which is a very Jewish part of the world again. And he's met by large crowds. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. At this point, there is not a crowd in his future that will not have Pharisees and Sadducees implanted in the crowd. The Pharisees asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? The Pharisees expect Jesus to answer with compassion, and if he does, he will deny what they believe is the law that Moses himself gave permission for divorce. So Jesus' response is brilliant because it it teaches the true purpose or the intent of the Mosaic law. Jesus says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Jesus reminds them of the very beginning, the very purpose for marriage itself. I've often taught the marriage relationship on earth is the closest relationship we have to the relationship that God wants to have with us, where you think the same and you can finish one another's sentences. The marriage relationship was supposed to be a covenant relationship between God and man. And so Jesus says, so because of the Mosaic law, the original created 
meaning of marriage. They are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. That was the intent of covenant marriage. It was to become one person. Now, that kind of marriage requires both people to want to live under God's covenant. The most important choice we make in our lives is to choose somebody to marry. And how important is it that we choose somebody who will share this covenant, not only with one another, but with God? So in verse 7, the Pharisees say, Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? They are trying to argue with Jesus. And Jesus replied, Moses, keyword, permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. Moses' law that he wrote was to limit the problem. It was to limit bigger problems. But it was not this way from the beginning, Jesus said. It wasn't what God intended for marriage. And so Jesus says, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Jesus will raise the standards uh, for marriage. Remember, he's already raised the standard for adultery. It's anyone who looks at a woman in, in a sexual way or in, an, in a wrong way has committed adultery. Remember, he redefines the level of character we're supposed to have as Christians. The disciples said to him, they're shocked by Jesus' words too. And they said, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. They're still trying to comprehend his new covenant teaching with their old covenant laws in mind. And Jesus has a thoughtful response to them. He tells his disciples, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? That there are those who cannot be married, those who choose not to marry, and those who choose to live like a eunuch in order to be more available to God for the sake of the kingdom. The one who can accept this should accept it. We were made man and woman, but we were given free wills and all of us are issued a calling. Is every human being on this planet supposed to marry? No, there are some who are not supposed to marry. Are there some that are born not able to marry? Yes. They're absolutely born that way. It doesn't give permission to sin. Remember, the sexual relationship is limited in Scripture to a man and a woman. It's limited to the very picture of what Jesus said, that the two shall become one. It is a covenant blessing of God to those who join their lives together and let's face it, the sexual relationship has created more sin and more pain and more agony in this world because of the way it's been used outside of God's plan for it, outside of it being a blessing upon a covenant relationship. It's not hard to tell what God wanted because we can see the consequences of what happens when it's misused. The next passage is a reminder that we need to see this in light of first century beliefs. 
because the act of laying hands on children wasn't usually accomplished by rabbis, but people who had a, a lesser position in the synagogue. Uh, a, a blessing on a child was considered to be not a right use of the rabbi's time. He was there for the sake of the adults. And Jesus teaches another important new covenant truth. All ministry is important. And to serve is to be a minister to all people equally. Again, an overwhelmingly difficult concept for the Jewish believers to enter into for the new covenant. So in verse 13, Matthew writes, Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. The people that had brought the children, the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And when he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. It is a wonderful statement of Jesus. There, remember, he's already taught them to be like children. He's already intimated and illustrated that the Gentiles are going to be like children when they come into the faith, not knowing much. And yet, as children, they came into the faith knowing they didn't know, and the Gentiles would become powerful in the kingdom of heaven. It's just a truth we have. Those who think they know are actually less likely to grow in faith than those who realize how much they need to know. And then he talks about the rich and the kingdom of God. This is one of the most famous parables of Jesus. He said, just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus said, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Then the rich young man says, well, which ones? He's negotiating, which is what business people do. And a faith relationship with Jesus isn't a negotiation. It is a humble acceptance of the fact that we can never do enough to be part of the kingdom, to be allowed or good enough for the kingdom. And so Jesus replies to the young man, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your mother and father, and love your neighbor as yourself. To this I would have said, raise your hand if you haven't broken at least three of those today. That's the nature. Jesus puts in front of him the impossibility of keeping the written commandments. The Old Testament law wasn't an expectation, it was a goal. The Old Testament law existed to help people understand how much they needed God because no one has ever lived the Ten Commandments perfectly. And yet the rich young man says, all these I have kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? In other words, oh, I'm good. I've, I keep those commandments, but if there's something else I need to know. And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Jesus picks the one thing he knows that this man will not give up. He's not being cruel. He is teaching an essential truth to this young man and to everyone listening. You can't do anything to be perfect. He wants the man to understand how much he needs God. And so it said when the young man heard this, he went away sad. Do you know this is the only story in scripture of a person who approaches Jesus and goes away sad? Why? Because he had great wealth. And so Jesus then turned to his disciples 
and again uses rabbinic hyperbole, saying, truly I tell you, it is hard for somebody who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus uses rabbinic hyperbole because he wants his disciples to understand how completely they will need his sacrificial offering, his, the blood of the cross for their salvation. When the disciples heard this, it says, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. Jesus looks at him and said, it's impossible for a man to do enough to be saved. But with God, all things are possible. Because of God's grace, their salvation will be made possible in a very short amount of time. Remember, Jesus is faced towards Jerusalem right now and the cross. So Peter answered him saying, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He in essence tells them your reward will be great for being my disciples, but your reward will also be eternal. In verse 29, it says, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. To follow Jesus will require all of us to give up a lot of things we love. It will be to place Jesus ahead of a lot of things we wish we could keep or have. It's a sacrifice to step into a relationship with Jesus as Lord, as King of your life. But we can live every day reminded that those of us who choose to be last or try to choose to make him king of kings in our lives, will be first in the kingdom of heaven. Again, who's first, who's greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The one who becomes like a child and gives it all up for the sake of making Jesus Lord. So Jesus teaches new covenant standards. It's gonna require humble recognition of our great need for salvation and great understanding that the only reason we get to go to heaven and live with the knowledge we have eternal life is not because of anything we've done, but only because of the grace of God. Our rewards for living under the new covenant are often going to be eternal. Jesus tells the parable of the workers in the vineyard, and I'm going to fly now. There's a lot of scripture left. You know that the landowner hires workers who work for him throughout this one day, and they've agreed to work for one denarius each day. The ones who got hired early in the morning did more work than the ones who were hired late. And they thought they should have earned more at the end of the day. But the landowner tells them in verse 13, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious? because I am generous. So again, the last will be first and the first will be last. God is going to let the Gentiles into the kingdom of God, even though 
the Jewish people had been faithful their whole lives. They aren't going to inherit more than the Gentiles. And some might feel like that was wrong. Some will feel bad about that and be envious of the Gentiles later. But God says, don't I have the right to do what I want to do? And now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. Up doesn't mean he was going north. It means he was going up the mountain. Jerusalem is placed at the highest peak of the Holy Land. And it says on the way, he took the 12 aside and said to them, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. I mentioned before what I'm going to say again. This is actually the third time Jesus refers to his death and resurrection. I mentioned in an earlier taping of an earlier chapter, and I was wrong that time. This is actually the third complete time. He is on his way to Jerusalem, and he tells them again, this is going to happen. The mother of James and John's comes and kneels before Jesus with a favor. She believes, okay, this death is going to happen, but she kneels before Jesus. And his, before he can enter Jerusalem triumphantly, she asks that her sons sit on either side of Jesus in his kingdom. And Jesus looks at her and says she doesn't know what she's asking. He says, can they drink the cup? that Jesus will drink? And the answer is no. That will be the literal cup he takes of execution on a cross, sacrifice. So Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father the disciples will go on to their own execution, many of them. Only John lived a natural life and died a natural death. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. And Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. He's still teaching what he's been trying to explain to them. Great is one who serves. In fact, he says, whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed them. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard Jesus going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, Messiah, have mercy on us. Those with great need are most likely to trust Jesus as Messiah. The crowd rebuked the two blind men and told them to be quiet. The crowd believed those men were blind because of their sin. That was the basic belief in the first century. But they shouted, the blind men shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, Messiah, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and called them. And he said, what do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. And in a picture of who Jesus is. It says Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. He touched the very people others believed to have sinned, physically touched them, stating to all those watching, I am above this law that says to touch them makes me unclean. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. Over and over the miracles of Jesus teach that he is above Jewish standards, Jewish laws. These parables that Jesus has been teaching are one illustration after another about God's grace and God's compassion. 
versus those who think somehow they can earn their way into heaven. They earn a right relationship with God. There's an important new covenant truth that A.B. Simpson, a pastor and founder of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, writes about. He talks about what it means to be holy, to be right and acceptable to God. He said, holiness of heart and life, this is not the perfection of the human nature, but the holiness of the divine nature dwelling within. You and I are not holy because we have somehow controlled our human natures or made them better. We are made holy because we have received the nature of Jesus Christ into our lives through his Holy Spirit. It is our calling to be like children. It is our calling to accept the role of servant. And it is our calling to know that the only things we can accomplish for the sake of the kingdom happen because we are willing to allow Jesus Christ to accomplish them through us by yielding our lives as a servant to his Holy Spirit. Let's think about how we are called to be servants of Christ and let's yield to his perfect authority in our lives. See you next time.